what is it about math? What is it about mathematics that makes it such an effective tool for learning about the universe with so many applications in such diverse fields? Even the, advanced, uh, the objects that advance mathematics studies can be very abstract and very weird, and these two have surprising relevance in the world around us. What is that? And what is it about mathematics, the logical, some might say cold, study of abstractions that can inspire such intense emotions in people? Uh, profound love, deep passion, or maybe intense anxiety. What is it about math that sees so many people putting it behind them saying, I was never very good at math? For that matter, although in completely different ways, what is it about music? What is it about music that makes it such a powerful tool for approaching problems in our social lives, our emotional lives, our political and our civic lives? What is it about music that inspires such intense emotions in people? Music, too, uh, can leave people, while still enjoying it, saying, I'm not a very musical person. There's lots of connections between math and music. I'd like to talk about one that I perceive as underlying how we listen to and appreciate music and how we approach and solve mathematical problems. And that's the idea of tension and release. Concerning tension, we as humans are remarkably good at feeling tense and anxious and afraid, and that's a wonderful thing. The recognition of threats and the fear of danger has enabled us to survive throughout the millennia. But of course, fear can get the better of us, it can cause us to make poor decisions, and we need to find ways of managing and releasing ourselves from fear, too much fear. And because it pertains to both math and music, I'll mention that we're also remarkably good at recognizing patterns. We're fascinated by them. We love finding patterns. And this is a wonderful thing, too. It's enabled us to grow crops, to treat illness, to create and modify political and civic structures. But here, too, our love of patterns and our search for them can sometimes get the better of us and cause us to make poor decisions. We can misidentify patterns, misattribute them, extrapolate them in unhelpful or sometimes even harmful ways. Mathematical thinking can give us a really, really powerful way of gaining some control over our innate love of patterns. And we need mathematical thinking. If we're going to grapple with complicated problems like climate change, economic disparity, the management of limited resources, the spread of illness, we need mathematical thinking. We need to cultivate and grow and nurture our mathematical thinking skills now more than ever. But it's hard to cultivate mathematical thinking skills and to nurture them when all too often mathematics can inspire some really intense anxiety. I know what it is to feel anxious when doing mathematics. Early on in my undergrad, I didn't know whether I wanted to study math or music, in part because I found music soothing. Mathematics was not always soothing for me. But as I took more mathematics courses, I was really surprised to hear my math prof speak about mathematics with such warmth, in such affectionate tones. They spoke about math not as though they found it fun and interesting or even profoundly important. They spoke about math as though they really loved it and saw true beauty there. And I didn't get that, and I wanted to know more about it. In short, my math prof spoke about math the way I was expecting my music profs to speak about music. Of course, my music profs did say some, did, they did speak about music in really affectionate tones, and one of my music profs said something, other people have said the same idea, that to him, music was nothing more and nothing less than patterns of tension and release. Now, I don't want to turn this into a music theory class, but I just want to give some very simple examples of this. If I play a simple phrase, and then play it again, we're consciously or subconsciously waiting for that final note. And if I modify it, and if I hang there, I'm very subtly creating some kind of tension that our ears are perceiving, and it gets released or resolved when I play that note there, which you might call the home note or the root note. And that's a very simple example of what you might call melodic tension and release. We can do more with this. You can create harmonic tension and release through the use of chords. 
So if I establish that as the home chord or the root chord, that's where things start out, if I move away from that chord, I can create varying degrees of tension. And if I play this chord in particular, that resolves or releases very nicely back to the home chord. In part, that's because this chord contains an interval called the tritone, which by itself is kind of dissonant, but it resolves very nicely to that interval, which is in the home chord. And so you can hear how this chord pulls, the tension is created, and it pulls back towards home. <laughs> And jazz harmony kind of takes this to an extreme. Even in a very simple, the most basic jazz progression, a 2-5-1, you can hear some kind of tension and release happening there, even if you're not aware of the music theory. If I change that a little bit, I can create tension within a release. If I play this chord, that sounds a bit like the home chord, but there's a couple of extra notes there that create some kind of tension. You're wondering what happened, maybe what's going to happen next. Um, those, that's just some, some very simple examples of harmonic tension and release. There's other kinds of, as well. A very kind of a raw example of tension and release in music is that which occurs often in electronic dance music, the build up and the drop. This occurs in other forms of music as well. Uh, what you'll have is maybe just a, the music quiets down a little bit, and then you'll have this rising crescendo. Things are getting a little bit louder. Uh, synths, are, synths are building. You have these rising frequencies. And you can sense that something is about to happen, but you don't know quite what, and you don't know quite when. And that tension builds and builds and builds. And then finally, the bass kicks in, and the kick drum kicks in, and the beat takes off, and you go away. Now, that's another example. There's all sorts, though. There's all sorts. Sometimes repetition itself creates a form of tension. If I were to just play this chord. for two minutes straight, you would start to wonder, when is something going to happen? Sometimes fun funk music exploits this really, really, in, in really interesting ways. The familiar can itself lead to some kind of tension. And when something different does happen, you feel that released. There's all sorts of ways to create tension or perform tension and release in mathematics. A couple other examples, just since I'm on the topic, rhythmic tension and release. This is particularly common in, in, uh, in modern hip hop music where you'll hear uh, drum patterns just in a slightly off beat in really creative and interesting ways. Lyrics can add a whole other dimension of tension and release to listening to music. Even the social or political context of a song can create tensions and releases that affect how we listen to and perceive that song. Now, while tension and release is related to the familiar and the unfamiliar, it, they don't quite correspond that nicely. Sometimes the familiar is, is what causes the tension, and the unfamiliar releases it. There can be uh, tensions within releases, releases within tensions, and they can occur in really, really interesting and complicated ways. And our ears perceive them and our brains perceive them, even if we're not consciously aware of the music theory. This is part of what makes music so rich and rewarding for us. And I would argue that the more we can appreciate and understand and develop a capacity uh, for these kinds of tensions and releases, the deeper our appreciation for music is. But here's the thing. With music, these tensions aren't genuine tensions. We don't take them personally. They just happen. They pass through us. They wash over us. And then we're ready for the next tension, even if we're not aware of it. Now let's move to math. Picture sitting down to solve a math problem or maybe a set of math problems. Maybe there's some tension there right at the start. Do we know what the problem is asking? Are we going to be able to solve it? Maybe you, that tension gets released, and you start to make some progress on the problem, but then you encounter some obstacle. Maybe you're able to think of some technique that might be helpful here, but you can't quite remember the formula. So you look up the formula. Maybe the jargon is a little bit different. Maybe the notation is a little bit different. Maybe there's some tension between how you've learned this in the past, how you've been taught in the past, and how you're being asked to apply that knowledge now. 
Maybe you made some judgment at the start about how difficult this was or wasn't going to be, and now that assumption is being challenged. Maybe you subconsciously made a judgment at the start about how long this should take you, and now it's taking way longer. Or it took way less time than you thought, and that's surprising, and you're not quite sure what's happening. You can have a tension within a release. OK, I got that. I don't fully know if I'll be able to do it the next time, but I got it now. Or you could have a release with an attention. I'm not quite sure why that worked, but I got the answer. These patterns of tension and release can happen in very complex, layered ways. And here, too, just like with music, I would argue that the more we can develop a capacity to work through these tensions and appreciate them, the richer our relationship with mathematics can be. But Here's the difference. Compared with music, now the tensions can be real. They can be personal, and they can get emotional. A tension that starts out as, hmm, I'm not quite sure if I remember how to apply this formula, can very quickly turn into, I'm not quite sure I'm smart enough to solve this problem. And that can turn into, I'm not quite sure I'm smart enough to learn this kind of mathematics. And that can turn into, I'm not quite sure I'm smart enough to do more mathematics. Maybe I've reached my limit. Maybe this is where math ends for me. And I'm OK with that. Now, sometimes mathematics can make you question your intelligence. And to some extent, that's natural. But for some people, in a competitive academic environment, Questioning your intelligence is a slippery slope to questioning your value. And that hurts. Now, it doesn't always play out that dramatically when we encounter some difficulty in mathematics. Of course, sometimes it's just fine. But there can creep in these subtle patterns of not just tension and release, but self-judgment and wondering whether we're good enough to do this anymore. And that can hurt. But I don't think it has to be that way. What if, what if we were able to learn mathematics in a way where the tensions that happened weren't emotional, if we just welcomed them the way we welcome them with music, without letting them, uh, without letting them lead us to a path of, I'm wondering whether this is good enough. What if we just let the tensions happen, pass through us, wash over us? They won't just disappear, but they're there, and we welcome them, and we acknowledge them. And that's part of learning mathematics. It's just part of it. Just like tensions in music, that's just part of listening to music. I think that can happen. I think that people, individuals, are at the same time more musical than we give ourselves credit for, and also more mathematical than we give ourselves credit for. We have a deep, as a species, we have a deep love for music. That's a very safe statement to make. We as a species have a very deep love of mathematics. That's maybe a bit of a stretch. <laughs> but what if I tweaked it a little bit? What if I said, we as a species have a deep fascination with mathematical thinking, with problem solving, with finding patterns, with working with patterns, with breaking hard problems down into simpler problems, and exploring the space around us, and exploring the quantities that we encounter? I think that's true. I think we can cultivate slowly, very gradually, a more productive psychological relationship with mathematics. I won't say more positive, because it's too much to hope for that a subject as vast and interesting and complex and difficult as mathematics, that when we learn that, that it can always be fun and pleasant and enjoyable. It won't be. That's too much to hope for. But we can cultivate a more productive relationship where we welcome the struggle. That's part of it. We embrace it. Learning math is tough. I don't love math because I find it easy. I love math, in part, because I find it hard. And I think that we can achieve this kind of relationship with mathematics, but only if we can embrace the inherent, the inherent tension in mathematics. It is a difficult subject for us to learn, and it will be. But only if we can release ourselves from the paralyzing self-judgment.